International Airport is often the scene of Canadians departing for their winter holidays in Cuba. Today, Jacinda Fairholm is not heading off as usual. Instead, she is here to greet Cubans coming the other way. After months of paperwork and uncertainty, her guests are finally arriving. This is also a special moment for this small group of Cubans. Most have never left their country before. But they have not come to holiday or sightsee. They are here to share their unique experience in urban organic gardening. An experience that is drawing attention far from Cuba's shores. While in Canada, they will have the opportunity to visit with many producers but nothing in the months of planning for the trip has prepared them for their stay at Plan B. An organic farm led by two Chilean Canadian brothers, Alvaro and Rodrigo Venturelli. Jose and Reynaldo quickly settle into the swing of things at Plan B as they join in the pre-dawn preparations for their first day in the fields. Beneath their light-hearted manner and offbeat appearance, Alvaro and Rodrigo, Jacinda and others, represent a very serious international response to two of the most urgent challenges of our time, hunger and environmental degradation. The Cuban visitors are eager to learn as much as possible in the few days they will be working at Plan B about organic farming and marketing in Canada. I, I guess I would have to say that uh, the main reason that I was into having the Cubans come and visit and to uh, try and find ways to work with them is that they have been the reference around the world for sustainable initiatives. And so for them to come and want to study us as a, as a bit of a model, you know, for how to try and create viable new markets is, uh, is important, you know, for me to receive their support and as well for them to be able to see what people are doing in, in more open marketplaces. While they work side by side, they engage in serious and not so serious conversations about their different experiences as farmers. For example, the Cubans are fascinated to hear about Alvaro's prepayment direct customer service plan that provides upfront cash to the farmers at the beginning of the growing season in exchange for produce at the end. At the market, they pick up tips that they will take back home with them. On the other hand, Alvaro sees much in the Cuban approach to food security that he finds relevant. Meanwhile, America and Idalmis, along with Jacinda, are settling into the daily routine at St. Ignatius, a Jesuit organic farm in southern Ontario that is also run by a new generation of environmentally conscious farmers. It's always really exciting to work, to have your Cuban partners come up here and share their experiences because they, because they come with so much knowledge. They come with a lot of experience and background and years of, of struggle to achieve something that's sustainable and it's good to see that. Sonia, who is serving as the group's translator, will soon be traveling to Havana as a SIDA intern to learn more about what is taking place there. America Alarcón's roots in agriculture go back to her youth in the Cuban countryside. But she has only recently become swept up in the urban gardening revolution that has hit Cuba's cities. America and her husband Carlos, whom she married when she was 15, have a small garden in the suburbs of Havana that is on the leading edge of this national movement. In a few short years, they have turned a small plot around their house into a flourishing garden providing income for themselves 
and their growing children. Americas is one of thousands of gardens that have sprung up throughout the country as Cuba coped with the latest crisis in its troubled history. Since the revolution in 1959, this Caribbean island of just over 11 million people has seen tumultuous and difficult times. Cuba has survived many challenges, including embargoes, invasions, and isolation. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, it sank into a deep economic crisis. La crisis realmente nos golpeó en, en todos los sentidos. En los sentidos no solamente la, la cuestión alimentaria, sino en las cuestiones de la transportación, el grado de combustible. Cuba perdió el 85% del mercado internacional. When the socialist bloc crumbled in 1990, Cuba suddenly lost all of that ability to import the elements necessary for agricultural production, and at the same time, the United States intensified the trade embargo. The sudden drop in petroleum imports brought Cuba to a standstill. The now famous camels joined ancient U.S. cars and Soviet lattice on the streets of Havana. Bicycles became the norm for getting around, and Cubans spent hours traveling to and from their daily activities. With production of all sorts at a virtual halt, unemployment rose to levels not seen for decades. Food imports vanished overnight, and it was impossible to continue growing food as before. What little food they did manage to produce could not be transported from the fields to the tables of hungry Cubans. In the beginning, there was a bit more access, but as the situation deteriorated, all you had was your food rations, and that's it. There was nothing that you could buy, no matter how much money or cash you might have. So it was quite difficult, and nutritionally, it was a bad moment. There was an outbreak of optical neuritis, um, which is related to nutritional problems, right, that would cause temporary blindness and all sorts of really horrifying symptoms in people. La crisis fue un, fue un déficit total y realmente teníamos que cambiar nuestro paradigma, nuestra visión de cómo lograr eh, una economía eh, en nuestro país. Basically, Cuba could have gone in two different directions at that point. It either could have fallen apart uh, in, a, in a tremendous food crisis, riots, ingovernability, uh, maybe like what happened in Somalia, for example, or Cuba could pull together. With few options available to it, Cuba started to allow urban dwellers to grow and sell food in their neighborhoods. Co-ops were formed, kiosks built, and garbage dumps began to flower. Most of those involved did so as a way of meeting their immediate need to feed their families. Little did anyone suspect at the outset what far-reaching implications urban organic farming would have. The lack of fertilizers and pesticides meant that there was no other choice but to go organic. And by actually transforming their agriculture from industrial chemical intensive agriculture to smaller scale, more sustainable, more agroecological, almost semi-organic farming, uh, they were able to use Cuban resources rather than imported resources to make up for the imported food that they no longer had. Many of the empty lots that became urban gardens were in disuse before the special period. 
many of them were sort of informal dumping grounds uh, where people would throw household garbage. So they were actually vectors for unhealthy sites in the community. And many of these have been cleaned out and now turned into gardens. Esto era una, una loma de tierra de, de dos metros y pico, tres metros. Y aquí era un hueco. Aquí se echaron unas piedras que pesaban, que tenían 20 toneladas. Se tupió el hueco. Y más o menos es lo que tenemos, ¿no? es lo que tenemos. Before too long, people were producing more than they needed for themselves and were able to start selling to their neighbors. In addition to food, many also began growing spices and herbal remedies as pharmaceuticals were also in short supply. Nosotros le decimos si hay o no hay, porque a veces que no hay esa gran cantidad de, de siembra, ¿no? From rather tentative beginnings, this phenomenon of neighborhood gardens took off. The cities of Cuba began to turn around their desperate situation of hunger. Bueno, eso surge por una necesidad que tenemos realmente. Y después se ha visto que fue una cosa muy aceptada que eh, darle hortalizas frescas a la población así como se la damos nosotros aquí de una tierra que estaba sin, sin cultivar un espacio ahí lleno de hierba se creó puestos de trabajo para trabajadores y se, se le da a la población un producto fresco de calidad Martín. Eh, el plan de nosotros es de 28 mil kilogramos Son 28 toneladas. Por ejemplo, aquí vendimos hoy 135 libras de lechuga, aproximadamente. 50 libras de acerca. 30 libras de rábano. Using techniques adapted from Asia and other places and mixing them with Cuban inventiveness, a new form of urban growing known as the Organoponicos was born. These raised beds made with whatever is at hand maximize water retention, pest control, and rapid growth. They also allow land that is otherwise not good for growing to be used as the soil is created and contained on top of the surface in beds made from concrete tiles, bricks, stones, or anything else available. These organoponicos were only one of a number of urban garden models that were adopted. Others include intensive vegetable gardens, backyard plots, small suburban farms on the outskirts of town, institutions such as universities and workplaces also began planting gardens to meet their own needs. Within a few years, these small urban plots replaced thousands of abandoned lots in every major city and town in the country. But for the urban gardening to flourish, more than hard work and good intentions was required. Desde el año 1988, cuando comenzaron estos trabajos, hay que decir que los investigadores estuvieron involucrados en este proceso. Cuba has only 2% of the population of Latin America, but it has 11% of the scientists. And they develop cutting edge practices in, for example, biological pest control, which is using the natural enemies and diseases of pests to control them in ways that are non-toxic for human beings and compatible with organic farming instead of chemical pesticides. Or developing uh, compost, uh, large-scale worm composting, and other things that they call biofertilizers to replace the chemical fertilizers that they used to have. One of the most important sources of research and production is the national network of laboratories known as the CRE. 
the Center for the Production of Entomophages and Entomopathogens. In 1991, 280 crays were established around the country to supply each corner of the island. Under very basic conditions, skilled scientists develop and produce natural pesticides and fertilizers. Each province has its own cre, ensuring supplies are available and appropriate to local conditions. Other techniques, such as intercropping, are also part of the menu of choices available. While intercropping is not new to traditional and organic farming, it has been taken to unprecedented levels recently in Cuba. Intercropping with plants such as basil and marigold, which are planted at the head of each raised bed, also helps control insects and other pests. Another element of this approach is crop rotation which has proved useful particularly in controlling weeds. I take as a consequence that the agricultural urban has given a very big impulse to the biodiversity. When we talk inclusively about a cultivo of tomato, we talk about sembrar more than one variety of that cultivo, of that tomato. Puede venir una enfermedad y atacarnos el cultivo, pero cuando tú tienes dos, tres variedades, una variedad se afecta, a veces las otras dos no se afectan tanto y tú las puedes cosechar. The lack of available fertilizers led to the implementation of composting, another important piece of the organic gardening puzzle. En el compost de la lombricultura, lo que se echa la lombriz conjunto con los productos que ella debe de ingerir y su estiércol es lo que eh, se toma para, como materia orgánica para los cultivos. El resultado final de esto es esta, 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 esta tierra. Cuba's climate and fertility provide a natural source of readily available and high quality earth. Using worms to speed up the composting process, a technique known as vermi composting, in less than two months, the leftovers of one harvest are turned into soil for the next planting. While every garden uses this technique with their own composting efforts, large-scale compost operations have been set up on the outskirts of the cities to supplement the supply. The story goes, that this all started in 1986 with two boxes of worms and within a few years turned into a program producing tons of usable earth for the entire island. Cuban scientists are also actively studying the pros and cons of this compost for the productivity and health of various crops. Despite the best planning and know-how, Farmers, such as America, all have to contend with the unpredictable element of the weather, and Cuba is no exception. Hurricanes, rain, and drought have all added their measure of uncertainty and destruction to the growing cycle. Cuba's facing new challenges because of the drought, because of climate change that are and because of the number of hurricanes that have been coming through Cuba in the last year or two, that has a lot of um, uh, repercussions on agriculture. And part of what we have to do is to find ways to support rehabilitation when greenhouses are knocked over by hurricanes and crops are flattened and so on. Si el ciclón sigue el rumbo que tiene, los aires, si no pasa directo por aquí, pasando a a a ciento y pico, doscientos kilómetros aquí, los aires son poderosos. 
eso, todo el plátano ese se cae. Todo ese plátano se cae, todo el plátano y todo eso va abajo. En los últimos años hemos sido muy atacados por los huracanes. Huracanes que cuando pasan destruyen prácticamente toda la producción que tenemos en nuestros campos. E incluso que tenemos también nuestros organopónicos y nuestros gestos intensivos. Pero ¿qué pasa? Que al otro día de pasar el huracán, ya el cantero de un organopónico está listo prácticamente para recibir semilla y utilizando en estos casos de emergencia cultivos de ciclo corto, ya a los 22, 25 días está generando alimentos para la población. Por otro lado, durante los últimos años hemos tenido eh, un periodo muy intenso de sequía. Nuestro, mucha, muchas empresas, muchas granjas nuestras, de nuestra agricultura convencional, en muchos territorios no han podido producir, porque realmente, en primer lugar no llueve, en segundo lugar están instalados los sistemas de riego, pero que las fuentes se han agotado. Y realmente las únicas unidades que han estado produciendo en esos lugares han sido los organopónicos y huertos intensivos que tienen instalados sistemas de riego que economizan mucho el agua. In addition to new science and growing techniques, Cuba's green revolution has shaken traditional socialist systems of employment policies, land tenure, and market controls. At the same time, strong governmental infrastructures and support has allowed this movement to succeed. Cuba is a, is a highly organized society and it's organized at every level. It's organized at the community level and it's organized at the government level so that when something happens, has to happen, when you have to respond to an emergency or respond to a crisis, this high degree of organization means that resources, people, knowledge, ingenuity are mobilized very quickly. One important link in the chain of resource and knowledge sharing is another national network known as the consultorios. These consultorios have been set up in all neighborhoods to provide the tools, seeds and plants, as well as distribute the pesticides and biofertilizers produced in the national labs. One of the busiest consultorios is in Guanabacoa, an active community on the outskirts of Havana that has embraced urban gardening. Aquí en el consultorio, el técnico que trabaja en el mostrador, bueno, pues capacita a todo aquel que venga a nuestro consultorio a pedir ayuda, lo orientamos de cómo debe proceder al desarrollo de su agricultura. Llámese agricultura en un patio, en un jardín o en una finca. At each consultorio, agronomists and technicians are available to provide advice and information. These staff will also visit the gardens to troubleshoot and teach techniques in the field. This visiting agronomist program is part of a much larger support system of agricultural extension, education, and research. Today Magali gives advice on pruning guavas, natural insecticides to deal with ants, and applies a fungicide to save the ailing orchard. These technicians are also part of a larger endeavor to gather information and experience in the field, which is fed back into the national research strategy. For the urban gardening movement to succeed, it had to 